Would you, for the sake of Christ, gladly forfeit all of earth's joys and every comfort that you have? Would you be glad to be a pariah or seen as a pariah in this world if it means that you could still hold Christ? Just how valuable is Jesus to you? Hi, I'm Dr. John Newfeld. I'd like to welcome you to Back to the Bible Canada. I'm beginning a new series on the book of Hebrews today, and if you know or don't know the book of Hebrews well, I think you're going to be surprised at how relevant this book is to the situation in which we're living in today. Well, let me try to set the table and give a scenario that would work here. I want you to imagine a Jewish Christian in the first century. I'm going to give him a name. His name is Levi. And I'm going to have you imagine with me that Levi came to know Christ because he heard the gospel through a Jewish evangelist. And uh, Levi looked back at the, you know, at the Bible that he had been given and had been taught from childhood. And he came to realize that everything that he had been taught was fulfilled in the person of Jesus. And so by Christ's uh, miracles and by the teaching that he gave, the kingdom of God had already begun to reign. By Christ's crucifixion, all of the, you know, all of the things that he had hoped for and the forgiveness of sins was now his. And so with the resurrection of Jesus, the new age was upon him. And so here he was, the fulfillment of everything that he's taught, and he's filled with joy and he's filled with peace. But Levi's got a problem. And the problem goes like this. There is a sense of reality that has made his life much more difficult. First of all, his extended family has turned against him, and he's been removed from the synagogue, been thrown out. And that must have hurt a great deal. And then all of the great Jewish celebrations, the pilgrimage festivals, he could still go, but he is now ostracized from them, and that hurts even more. It seems like the tradition that he's been raised from has been yanked out from under him. But there's more. Uh, there's a new emperor who has begun to reign, and his name is Nero. And Nero looks very much like a madman, and it's hard to predict what he's going to do next. But you can begin to see that Nero has a jaundiced eye towards Christians. Uh, the Jewish people were still protected by some unique laws that allowed them uh, to not participate in pouring out sacrifices to Caesar. I mean, the Romans understood there were special sensibilities with the Jews, and you couldn't ask them to do something which they wouldn't do. But Christians were not given the same rights and freedoms. And so if now our Levi decides, I'll no longer pour out sacrifices, or I will never pour out sacrifices to Caesar, um, you know, as a Christian, he's no longer protected. And Levi is beginning to take all of that in. And just when it seems like the pressure is so high, uh, Levi now receives a letter, let's say, in the, in, in, um, in, uh, it's delivered to him and and it's from an old friend whom he grew up with in the synagogue. And the friend says, Levi, I know you're hard pressed. I know also that you've lost your job because of your Christian faith and you're struggling to raise your four kids and you barely have enough income to make it work. Come home, come back to the synagogue, simply renounce Jesus, come back to Judaism. We have a wealth of a history, the tradition that is our faith, come back to that which is yours. As you think about that, and I know I've just made that scenario up, but it's really less made up than you think. The book of Hebrews is speaking to people just like Levi, who now have a great deal of pressure to abandon their newfound faith in Christ and go back to Judaism for all of the reasons that I've given you. Now, you might say, well, that's great. I mean, that's what happened then, and, and uh, let's find out what, you know, how these guys survived. But how does that really relate to me today? So let me give you a, you know, a 21st century uh, equivalent of that. But I'm going to call now a fictional young man. I'm going to call him Jeremy. And I'm going to say Jeremy is raised in a Christian church. He went to Sunday school as a kid. Uh, he attended youth events, went to kids' camp. Um, he uh, did all the things, and uh, eventually uh, he went off to university. And when he got to university, he found out just how unpopular the Christian message actually was. From his church life, he had reveled in a truth. 
Every human being is made in the image of God. God made man in his image, male and female, he created them. And the beauty of that message is that out of this maleness and femaleness, God has called a man to leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and the two become one flesh. They form a new family unit where Christ is honored and adored. That's a beauty of the message, That part of the beauty of the message that he's been given. But when he gets to university, that very beautiful message is called an instrument of oppression. Indeed, he's now seen as a social pariah, someone who doesn't fit in. The theories of gender identity militate against the biblical teaching. He is called upon to affirm the new sexual agenda, and there are extremist groups on campus that say, you know what, I mean, anyone who says the Christian message not only should be discouraged from saying it, but they should be disallowed from speaking because that's hate language. And Jeremy has never been called a hater before. It's a new experience for him, and he wonders how he can survive. Jeremy never knew until he went to university whether or not he was a brave man, but he's about to find out whether he is. And in the midst of all of that, Jeremy starts dating a gal who says she's a Christian. He's happy about that relationship, but he soon finds out that she belongs to a liberal form of Christianity, which adopts all of the present social agenda. And the girlfriend that he has says, look, Jeremy, you don't have to hold to all those biblical teachings. I mean, you can be a follower of Jesus and you know, follow the new Jesus who accepts all the sexual politics of the day. You don't have to be a pariah. Simply abandon your fundamentalist beliefs, she says and come and become something that's more acceptable in the culture in which we live. I hope you understand that there's always been a pressure to abandon the Christian faith because it's always hard. There's always social pressure, regardless of where you are, which age you live in, or your particular context. It's always hard to follow Christ. Jesus said that it would be. So you see what I've tried to do? I've, I've tried to give a picture of what a first century Jew would have been living through, and then I've tried to compare that to somebody who lives in our own age and what they might be going through. But just when you think that these might be two off illustrations, let me take you to John chapter six. You know, in that chapter, Jesus is teaching his followers and his teaching becomes difficult. He says, unless you eat my flesh, and unless you drink my blood, he says, you have no part of me at all. And they begin to grumble among themselves, that is the followers of Jesus, and they say, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept this? And Jesus, and many of them say to Jesus, you know, we're done. I mean, this, you've taken us to places. We just don't know what to do with you, and we're not gonna follow you anymore. And then in John chapter six, verse 60, Jesus says to his disciples, um, he says, uh, you don't want to go away as well, do you? And the disciples don't ask for clarification. They don't ask how things are going to work out. They don't ask anything else. They simply say, Lord, where else are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. We don't know anybody who can take us through to eternal life outside of you. We're not leaving you regardless of how difficult it becomes. And when we hear those words, we're getting close to the theme of the book of Hebrews. See, the book of Hebrews is written by, to a group of Jewish Christians. Now that title, to the Hebrews, I mean, all the ancient manuscripts that we have of this book all begin with that title, to the Hebrews. And so this is who they were. This is a group of Jewish Christians. Maybe there were some Gentiles among them as well, but they were a group of Jewish Christians who were beginning to find out that it was harder to be a Christian than they had ever imagined. And the way back to Judaism didn't seem so tough. I mean, after all, aren't we accepting the same scriptures, both we Christians and our Jewish forefathers? So what would prevent us simply going back to the synagogue? And so the book of Hebrews gives a number of potential answers. But those answers all come down to one thing. Before you decide to abandon Jesus, you need to come to terms with what you actually have in Jesus. That is, how great a treasure is Jesus, and what would you actually give up if you lost him? So if 
Jesus is not the treasure that's hidden in a field for which a man will gladly give up everything to buy that field. If Jesus isn't that treasure, then you should, when it gets really tough, abandon him because surely your own life is more precious and your own well-being is more precious than him. But if Jesus really is the pearl of great price, if he really is the only pathway through to eternal life, if he is infinitely superior to anything else you have ever encountered, then it doesn't matter how hard it becomes because you have found that which that alone is worth living. And outside of that, you can't live. And see, and that is the theme of the book of Hebrews. But let's get back, and I want to give you a sense of what this book is like, what's it, how is it written, to whom is it written, who's the author, all of that kind of stuff, which will help us to get sense of it as we you know, begin a new series in the book of Hebrews. So let's just listen as the book of Hebrews begins, and it starts this way. Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers to, through the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Now, every manuscript, as I've said, that we have starts with to the Hebrews, and then it launches right in. And that tells us the book of Hebrews is actually different than every other book that we have in the New Testament. Well, how so? Well, we know we have the four gospels and we have the book of Acts, which give us historic, historic details of Jesus and the beginning of the church. The rest is a series of letters. And in each letter, what we have is a letter written the way an ancients would write a letter. I mean, Paul, apostle of Jesus Christ, to the saints who are in Galatia or in Philippi or in Thessalonica. In other words, the writer identifies himself and then he speaks to the audience to whom he's writing the letter. So that's what we have. But notice in the book of Hebrews, we have none of that. We have no identification of an author and neither does it tell us who the book is written to. And that fact has led a great many Bible scholars, and I think they're right about this, to say the way in which Hebrews reads doesn't read like a letter. It actually reads like a sermon. I think what we have here in the book of Hebrews is a first century sermon that's manuscripted, and then in the very last few verses of the entire book, you have some biographic details which would have been added at the end. So the sermon is complete, and then you know the, the person who preach the sermon, uh, then just adds a few things in the end because he knows not only did people hear this sermon, he's now sending this sermon out to a number of other people. Now, if that seems uh, hard for you, uh, understand this. If you were to read through the book of Hebrews, just read through it, all 13 chapters, you can have the entire thing read in slightly under an hour which would be the length of time of an early first century sermon. So it does seem quite likely this is a sermon. Well, then the question is, who preached it? I mean, or who wrote the book? And, uh, you know, it, I need to say at the outset that, you know, it was put into our Bible because there were people that argued that it was Paul who had actually written this book. But I'm going to say I don't think that Paul wrote it for a number of reasons. And, and, and here's one of them. In Hebrews chapter two, verse three, let me read this. It simply says, how shall we escape if we neglect such, such a great salvation? Now notice this, it, that is the, the message of our salvation, was declared at first by the Lord, that is by Jesus. Jesus is the one that gave us the message of salvation and it was attested to us, that is it was handed down to us the words of Jesus were handed to us by those who heard. That is, Jesus said the message, the apostles whom Jesus had appointed, they wrote it down and they taught it to us. Now that's how Hebrews reads. Paul would never have said words like that. What would Paul have said? Well, let me read to you from the book of Galatians chapter one and verse 11. Paul writes, for I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. I did not receive it from any man. See, the writer of Hebrews says, I received it from the apostles. Paul said, I didn't receive it from any man, nor was I taught it from any man, but I received it through a direct revelation of Jesus. I mean, that's the argument about why Paul's an apostle. Paul's an apostle, not because he was taught the gospel by others, 
but he was taught it directly by Jesus himself. That's what made him an apostle, and that's why Paul's an apostle along with you know, Peter and John and Matthew and all of the others who are apostles. So I, I guess what I'm saying here is that the book of Hebrews in chapter two, verse nine, or I'm sorry, chapter two, verse three, seems to indicate that the writer of Hebrews separates himself from the apostolic band. He says, I'm not one of the apostles. Well, who then wrote it? Well, there was an ancient Christian by the name of Origen, and Origen said, who wrote the epistle of Hebrews is known to God alone. Well, I, I, that's true, that's true. But I'm gonna also say at the same time, we also know that who wrote the book of Hebrews is not only known to God, but there's not an, there's not an infinite variety of different people who could have written the book. So we know it's not written by one of the apostles, not Matthew, not Mark, or I'm sorry, not John or Paul or Peter, but we know that under the apostles, there were a group of people called the prophets. They were directly answerable to the apostles and they wrote under the authority of the apostles. So for instance, when you write or read the New Testament book of Mark, what you're reading is you're reading Mark's depiction of the life of Jesus and Peter is standing over his shoulder looking down because we know there's an ancient church father by the name of Papias who told us this. Papias knew both Peter and Mark and he said, Mark wrote under the tutelage of Peter. So that's who the prophets are. They weren't apostles, but what they wrote, they wrote under the authority of the apostles. Well, then that means that the person who wrote Hebrews, because it's in our Bible, must have been among that select group of people who are directly accountable to the apostles. So who do we have left over that could have written the book of Hebrews? Well, I hear only really three legitimate names. And one is that it could have been Luke. Secondly, it could have been either Silas or it could have been Barnabas. Now I favor, just for whatever it's worth, because I don't know with absolute certainty, but I favor that I think that Barnabas actually wrote this book. Now look, it's kind of like doing a detective thing. You know, when you read a detective book, you know, and, you know who done it? And the answer is sometimes, I mean, you're going, sifting through clues and so forth. And it feels like that when you find out, find out who wrote Hebrews. And my best sense is it, it's very likely Barnabas, um, because Barnabas was a Levite, so he knew a great deal about the sacrificial ritual in the temple. And as we go through Hebrews, that's what we're gonna find out. There's a great deal about the sacrificial ritual in the temple. It seems like the person who wrote this could well have been a Levite, and Barnabas seems to fit that bill. Barnabas also traveled along with Paul. He preached alongside of Paul. So, you know, I don't know that it was Barnabas, but there are not limitless possibilities of who it was. Hebrews was written by a prophet who worked alongside of the apostles, who was recognized as a spokesman of Jesus. Again, I suspect it was Barnabas, but it could have been Silas. It could have been Luke. Well, let me now go from who wrote the book to asking and answering the question, to whom was this group of, uh, to this book written? Who actually received it? Well, again, as I've said before, all manuscripts that we have of this book have a same title, to the Hebrews. It was written to a group of primarily Jewish Christians. Yeah, there could have been some Gentiles among them, but I don't think there were many. Most of the Gentiles who came to Christ in the early days were called God-fearers. They were people who were hangers-on in the synagogue. Uh, they loved the God of Israel but they did not submit to either circumcision or Jewish restrictions, food restrictions, and so forth. And so um, when the gospel of Jesus was preached and they found out that they were saved by faith alone in Christ alone, they found out they didn't have to be circumcised or you know, adhere to Jewish dietary restrictions, they came to Christ. So there's no reason a Gentile God-fearer would be tempted to go back to Judaism where he would be excluded. You see what I'm saying? It doesn't seem likely that there are a great many Gentile believers that would have been you know, addressed in this book. They would have been primarily Jewish believers. They had come to know Christ as their savior. As Jews, they had latched themselves to Jesus as their Messiah. So that's the answer. 
and they were also Jews who now that they were Christians were facing persecution. So things had changed. The Jews still had a certain amount of protections under the law, but as Christians, all those protections were wiped away and they felt vulnerable now in a way that they had never felt before. So now the question is, where did these Jewish Christians live? And there are actually only two theories. One theory is that they lived in Israel. These were you know, Jewish Christians in the nation of Israel, and this is a letter that was written to them. I, however, think that's not the most likely scenario. And I think these were probably Jewish Christians that were living somewhere in Italy or had lived in Italy at some point in time in the past and had left. And why do I think that? Well, because the book of Hebrews has more Old Testament quotations than any other uh, New Testament book, uh, you'd expect that because of the kind of literature it is, but it also tells me that all of those quotations come from what's called the Septuagint. Now, what is the Septuagint? The Septuagint is the Old Testament translated into the Greek language. So it's not the Hebrew Old Testament, it's the translated Hebrew Old Testament into Greek, and all the quotations come directly out of that. So I would think these are not Jewish Christians living in Israel, but I think they're Jewish Christians that are part of what's called the diaspora, dispersed Jews all over the world who are not as familiar with the Hebrew Old Testament, and when they read the Old Testament, they read the Greek version of it. It seems to make sense to me. We also know that a man by the name of Clement of Rome, and he wrote this in about AD 95, so you think about that date, 95. What happened in 95? Well, it's probably the year that John wrote the book of Revelation. And so there's, a, there's an early Christian leader, his name is Clement, and he's called Clement of Rome, he lives in Rome, and he shows a great deal of familiarity with the book of Hebrews as he writes. So it seems to me that by 95, people living in Italy were very familiar with this book. And that doesn't mean it couldn't have made it you know, a wider you know, circulation, but it tells me that it was very well known there. And then also from Hebrews chapter 13, uh, verse 24, which is at the very end of the book, it simply says, greet all your leaders and all the saints and those who come from Italy send you greetings. So it might be that those who come from Italy are those who have left Italy. So they're Jewish Christians who've left Italy. And the writer of the Hebrews is saying, all of those people who've left Italy send you greetings. That must mean the believers who are in Italy. So it seems likely that the book was written to Jewish Christians, um, uh, maybe not in Rome particularly, but outside of Rome, somewhere like that. But when was the book written? Well, there are two possibilities here again. And the first one, well, let me take you back to Acts chapter 18, verses one to two. And here's what it says. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy, yes, and his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. Well, we know that's a very famous incident. Jews were believed to have been creating trouble in Rome. Some people think that the trouble was raised between Christian Jews and non-Christian Jews, and the trouble had spilled over into who knows what all kinds of riots may have uh, occurred, and Claudius, the emperor of Rome, simply said, I don't wanna know what the details are, all Jews are now banished out of Rome. So there are some that think, you know, the book of Hebrews, this makes a lot of sense if it was written in AD 49 when Claudius expelled the Jews from Rome. So that's one possibility. But I think a more likely probability is the book of Hebrews was written in the AD 60s, maybe 63 or 64. By then, Nero had become the emperor, and it was a program of persecution against Christians had begun, and it would make sense if these Hebrews were beginning to face the pressure that would eventually lead to martyrdom. So that seems the most likely scenario. 
These were Jewish Christians who either lived in Italy or outside of Italy who once lived there and were now under a new emperor who was a madman and looked like he was going to put Christians into his crosshairs. And these Jewish Christians would say, we can maybe save our lives if we run back to Judaism nothing bad will happen to us. Well, at any rate, whenever this book was written, let me promise you this, it was written before the year AD 70. The reason I say that is because in 70 AD, something monumental happened. The Romans waged war against the Jews, they broke into Jerusalem, they burned the temple to the ground, and they ended sacrifice and offerings from that day forward. Now, if this book had been written after that event, you would have expected that the book of Hebrews, which wants to make the case that when Christ has come, there's no longer any need for sacrifice and offerings, that the case would have been made better by saying, and besides, the temple in Jerusalem is burned to the ground. But the book of Hebrews makes no mention of that being the case. So we all assume, almost all the scholars assume the book was written before 70, and I put the date probably 63 or 64, that makes a great deal of sense to me, to a group of Jewish Christians, again, to repeat myself, who are facing this angry response of the Roman government. And, you know, as I've said, that leads us to a contemporary question. Whether the pressure in the West to embrace the new sexual politic or the pressure in other places in the world to avoid prison and social ostracism. The question is always the same. It's the question that Hebrews raises. How valuable is Jesus? Would you, for the sake of Christ, gladly forfeit all of earth's joys and every comfort that you have? Would you be glad to be a pariah or seen as a pariah in this world if it means that you could still hold Christ just How valuable is Jesus to you? That's the theme of Hebrews, and that's why it's relevant. It's relevant because we live in a day where we have now had a number of high-profile cases in which people have openly renounced their faith and said, I no longer follow Jesus. I mean, we've seen that with some so-called leaders, although most of their leadership is suspect from the beginning anyway, but we've seen that in a number of cases, but it brings us back to the theme of this book. Now, very quickly, the book is easily outlined. First two chapters uh, deal with the supremacy of Jesus over everything. It's what I want to deal with in this series. Uh, the, The next two chapters, chapters three and four, is the supremacy of Jesus over Moses. Then chapters five all the way to chapter 10 is the supremacy of Jesus over everything that happens in the tabernacle or in the temple. Jesus is supreme over all the sacrificial system and over all the high priest and over everything else that happens there. And then chapters 11 all the way to the end of the book in chapter 13 are the practical applications of what that means for us personally. So this thing is a very interesting book So it tells us why we should cling to Jesus, but it also tells us how to understand the Old Testament, how to look at all the teachings of the Old Testament and see how it is that Christ fulfilled it and therefore why Christ is the theme of the entire Bible. Abandon Christ and you have to throw your entire Bible away as well. So let me begin again with the outset. Hebrews chapter one, verses one and two. The sermon begins. Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Now notice the words, God spoke. That Those words should ring in our ears, especially in the day of uncertainty in which we live. Look, please understand that so many people are saying today, we live in a post-truth era. That is, none of us can know objectively whether anything is true. We can't even know with certainty our own gender. How can we know anything else? See, objectivity is a thing of the past. Subjectivity, how I feel, that's a thing of the present. See, that's the world we live in. So abandon all objectivity. Abandon that you can know the truth. And to that, the writer of Hebrews responds by saying, don't you know 
that God has spoken. He's not silent. He's not left for us to grope through the darkness to see whether or not we can find our way to him. No, no, no. God has spoken. Long ago, he spoke by the prophets. Long ago, he spoke in many different ways. We have a record of his dealings in history, but that record has reached a point of culmination. It's reached its apex. It's reached the point of the entire story. In these last days, the fulfillment of everything that the prophets had longed for has come to be. Christ Jesus has stepped into the world, and now there is the time of the ultimate fulfillment of everything. So, what would you abandon if you abandoned Christ? The answer is you would abandon the fulfillment of the purpose of God's agenda for all of creation to the present. You would abandon meaning. You would abandon objectivity. You would abandon any sense of certainty, and you'd be left groping around in the darkness, as so many are doing in our day. Think about the certainty that Christ offers, and before you throw everything away, because it's so hard to follow Jesus, remember the priceless treasure that you have received. Hey, thanks for being a part of Back to Bible Canada today. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being encouraged in your faith. I encourage you to continue to stand strong in Jesus all the way to the end. Heavenly Father, I pray, bless God's people and for those who are considering the gospel. I pray, Heavenly Father, that the words from Hebrews about the supremacy of Jesus over everything would ring true in their lives and that you would bring many more to faith in Christ. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. May the Lord bless you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you for watching today, and I want to ask you to make sure that you hit the like button and also subscribe to this channel so that you can receive any further notifications of all the videos that we prepare for you. Um, thank you so much for being a part of Back to the Bible Canada.